Good evening. I'm Billy Tesek, the president of National Association of uh, Women in Construction, NEWIC, Qatar. I hope you and your families are safe and well. On behalf of the NEWIC Qatar Foundation Board, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our partners and sponsors for joining us. Qatar University, Public Works uh, Authority Ashkal, GHD, Parsons, GSONIC, ERGA, Turner & Townsend, Qatar Financial Center, Lean Construction Institute Qatar, LCI, and TMF. Here we are again with our second leadership series webinar on agile leadership, how to lead with re resilience in uncertainty, with Rebecca Morris. Last week, uh, Rebecca presented to us on how to balance efficiency, inclusion and diversity. Thank you again, Rebecca, and thank you to the attendees for their great feedback on the webinar. Next week, we will finalize the leadership webinar series on agile leadership with how to lead powerfully using observational intelligence, identifying patterns, interrupting behaviors, and integrating expectations. Before we start, I would like to note a few points. The session is being recorded and will be available with a copy of the presentation slides next week. Um, in saying that, um, whoever has attended the previous uh, uh, week's uh, webinar uh, will receive their um, their certificate uh, and the recording um, probably tomorrow. Uh, to receive your electronic uh, attendance uh, certificate, you're required to attend at least 90% of the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the, in the chat box on the right-hand side of the screen. We will have a question, question and answer session after the presentation. And um, in case we are not able to answer to all of them, we will post the answers with, uh, with the presentation uh, and recording next week. The webinar, including a QA session, uh, should probably approximately take uh, around one and a half hours. We appreciate your full attention during the webinar, so please stay away from anything that may distract you. During, uh, during or after the webinar, uh, if you could please enter your feedback, uh, plus sign for positive feedback and a delta sign for any suggestions or improvements that you may have for us to enable us to, to, to uh, continuously improve our events. Now we got to the key part of the evening and before I hand it over to Rebecca for our attendees that are joining us first time that weren't with us last time for the leadership series, let me tell you about Rebecca and her background. Rebecca is a cultural and resilience leader. She's also known as a mindset mentor, speaker, facilitator, author, consultant and leadership coach. She founded Paradigm Shift in 2011 as she repeatedly saw corporate career leaders allowing chaos to reign rather than choosing effective change. She's passionate about ensuring organizations choose the right cultural model, and this includes ensuring healthy, safe employees by using the right mental health and well being programs. She brings over 30 years of experience in New Zealand, Australia and, uh, and the US markets and has achieved great sales success in the IT industry, CEO experience in the business coaching market and senior leadership experience across markets. Rebecca provides high passion, high energy and has high experiential expertise in every client she works with. This has seen paradigm grown from strength to strength. Rebecca's unique approach shifts leaders as well as businesses, whether she is in a facilitation, coach or consultancy role. She is able to expertly focus on the root cause of behavioural patterns. She gains a deeper understanding of why people operate over the top of these behaviours and sees the direct, the direct correlation of these results in the business arena. She is the founder of the annual MORE, 
premier leadership summit as she's passionate about solving the systemic issues currently in New Zealand around this topic. She believes that only when we create action at an individual, organization and community level, this will change. Rebecca's first book, Empower Me, The Magic is in Believing It's Possible, was released in January 2016 and is a book primarily uh, based on mindset. This book follows her journey and how her experience have shaped her life both personally and professionally. She believes you are what you think and your behaviors and thoughts condition the results you get in life. Her second book, Wonder Woman, what the hell happened was released in june which is a self-help book to show women how to break through the glass ceiling her third book observational intelligent leadership is due out in september this year she has online mastered your mindset programs that were uh, released in april this year rebecca over to you Thank you, um, Billy. It's always, as I said last week, humbling to listen to and actually reflect on our journeys. And it's and it's um, fabulous to uh, have me here this evening. And um, so thank you for the opportunity um, to actually um, speak and um, and host this uh, Agile Leadership Series, which really is so exciting for me. Um, this particular topic, indeed, how to lead with resilience in uncertain times. And let's face it, boy, we have some uncertain times at the moment. Um, tonight, um, I wanna balance the elements of science um, and the emotions of good judgment when we come to resilience. And as I did last week, and you'll have these slides, um, I really wanna get present to um, what resilience actually means um, and then looking at uncertainty. So I was just um, chatting with um, Billy uh, before we started and I understand that you guys are, are now moving to into stage three um, in a couple of weeks, which, which allows a whole lot more movement. And with that, sometimes um, creates further uncertainty where, as I note in New Zealand, when we you know, went back to um, fairly normal after COVID, um, yeah, there was a lot of angst and anxiety and overwhelm around um, how do we integrate back and, and, and have normal life. So um, we'll get started. Uh, I just want to remind you, <clears throat> I think agile leadership, as we talked about last week, I love this slide and I'm going to do it next week as well, because I really want you to get really clear on agile leadership is about you as a leader. But more importantly, it's your job to inspire your teams, empower them and serve them and, and others in your, uh, in your community. So basically what I loved about this is we've got to create the conditions for your people to fully realize their own capacity and power. Power not from an ego or control perspective, but powerful in terms of believing and having that potential to, you know, come to work and feel and do and be who, who, who you are as a person. I know that sounds kind of weird, but a lot of the time I find that uh, we are not. We're, we're part of a persona that perhaps we've put on, um, or uh, for some of us, it's that imposter syndrome where we, or fake it till we make it, where we're consistently challenging ourselves to go, what if they find out one day I am not who I, I really am? What if they find out that I can't do this stuff, or I can do it, but um, stuff is, is showing up for me in the way? So um, if we're creating conditions for our teams to fully realise their own capacity and power, um, you're with them in the trenches, but you're also, um, they're also doing it more importantly when you are not around. And I think that's the power there. So, you know, my, my question to you always, as you know, when I do these is, you know, are you inspiring your teams? Question number one, are you empowering them? And are you serving them in the way? Because if you've got that balance right between the three, it is about agile leadership and you are doing what you need to do in terms of that. So if we look at resilience, well, when I started, I've been doing quite a few resilience uh, webinars and um, 
and workshops just recently, obviously. So resilience is such a big topic. Um, and for me, when I looked at um, some of the research and the definitions around what resilience is, it's, it's, it's huge. Uh, in terms of the span of where it can be used. Um, one of the things I loved was imagine if we could have a miracle drug called this resilience and we could all pop one of those pills every day and it would actually just give us resilience. Unfortunately, um, we kind of have to with resilience go through, um, go through it. And the more that we go through it, the more resilient we become. So what I loved about this is uh, resilience is the ability and energy to bounce back. And the reason I've put energy in there is because, and we touched a little bit on it last week, is ability and competence is one, <clears throat> but energy is huge in terms of getting back up or getting, um, getting going again. So um, psychological resilience is the ability to cope um, in a pre, you know, um, is, is to cope with stuff as it comes up in a crisis or trauma mode and then return to the pre-crisis trauma state. However, we never kind of go back to the normal. It's obviously a new normal. Um, so what we need to know when we look at resilience is um, we have this um, ability when a person, um, when we understand what our key behavioral stresses are and why we react the way we do to certain things and where it came from and why it keeps coming up, then that actually helps us to move forward through it. So it potentially um, delves into and, and eliminates um, the potential negative effects of the stresses. So I guess um, the, the key points there are for me, it's about the ability and energy to bounce back from a stressful state. Psychological resilience, especially with something like COVID-19, which has come literally out of the ether into, into our lives and it's been forced upon us. Um, it's around... Sorry, Bex. Um, Sorry, Bex. Uh, we can't see the screen. Um, okay. Let me just go back. Amna, can you pop that up for me? Can you see that? Um, Amna, are you there? Yeah, she, 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 she is there. Because um, I've got it through going through mine, so that's really interesting, isn't it? Definitely not there. Okay, here we go. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, can you see that? Yep, yep, now we're good. Now we're good. Can you just let me know again, Billy? Not sure what happened there. Okay, okay. Oh, no, no worries. <laughs> no worries. Okay. <laughs> Jump in again. Um, so resiliency, ability and energy to bounce back. So we good with that? Billy, we good? Okay, so um, one of the things that I talk about um, when we're looking at behaviours is, um, I love this, it comes from um, Dr. Uh, Vessel uh, Vervolk, who's a German um, psychotherapist, and he talks a lot about the tour mentor, and I love this because um, in situations where we're trying to understand what's in the way for us, um, the tour mentor brings everything to the surface that we need to notice. So tour is about bringing stuff to the surface and mentor is actually dealing, uh, uh, choosing to deal with it or not. So um, what we find when we go into this, um, this space of um, of high stress or uh, where we're feeling emotionally or physically emotionally um, not resilient, we need to start looking at why. Why is it that we're reacting the way we are when we're faced in this situation? And unfortunately for a lot of us who perhaps haven't done personal development work, um, 
an, an example of this is COVID-19 can bring up things that we need to uh, notice and actually decide on whether we choose to deal with it or not. I promise you if you do have some of these things that are coming to surface, um, choosing to deal with it is, is obviously the best option and there's many ways around that because what that allows you to do is not create um, the, the boxes for you to keep, keep um, pushing it back down to just let it sit. So um, for example, an example might be that um, uh, if we take a really simple example is, you know, my work environment, every time I go to work, I'm feeling highly stressed and anxious and it's bringing out um, some behaviours that I know that aren't um, working for me, but I continue to do it. So having been through COVID, perhaps if I was working from home, it would give me an understanding that my environment changes because I'm much more comfortable in my home environment. And then I can get to see that there's quite a big um, difference in terms of um, my home environment, what I can do and my work environment. And so therefore we've got to really understand what is in the way for you when you work in, when you walk into that work environment. So what are the triggers at that person self in, um, situation or environment and why why are they there? So it's really about starting to delve um, below the layers and coming back into that um, pre pre-development around stresses and we'll talk a little bit about those behaviors next week in the third seminar. So tormentor, what's coming to the surface? So when we look at this, there's um, a lot of research around, but um, in, in order to really understand resilience in a simple way, let's, um, let's look, I've sort of made these five pillars that I believe really um, embrace and um, cover resilience. So the first, of course, is self-awareness. So for me, what I, <clears throat> excuse me, what I mean by self-awareness is really, do I understand who I am? Do I understand um, uh, everything about me in terms of my little idiosyncrasies? Do I understand how I tick? Um, when I do a lot of uh, behavior change work, I liken the self-awareness piece to um, we start off with an onion, right? And at the core of the onion is the start and it just builds these layers as it grows. And so if you can imagine as individuals, that's what we do as we grow, right? So we start with our heart at the core and we build on these layers. And some of us have these layers that work really well and it increases us in terms of our understanding and our confidence and our competence. And other of us, others of us who have had some different experience in that initial stage, our layers are more like protection layers. So we build um, layers around us with strategies that we learn and we, we, keep, um, we keep very guarded. So not many people can get to the core to understand the real us. So we find that when we're really self-aware, self-awareness is absolutely critical to owning uh, leadership. Because if you can imagine, if you're an agile leader who's not self-aware, the mirror, we talked about the mirror last week, what you do is what you see is what you get. You're portraying that to your teams and across your organization. And so what that means is the guys are picking up or the teams are picking up on um, your inability to be confident, probably um, decisive, um, decisiveness, that real strength in owning power uh, when you're when you're in um, in front of your teams. So self-awareness is absolutely critical because you can't be aware of others until you understand yourself. So the question I leave with you just around self-awareness and the onion is, you know, where are you at in terms of portraying yourself around self-awareness? So have you built the layers because there are protection layers around you and you've built strategies around that? Or is it that you are fully present and understand um, yourself in terms of your leadership persona and what that is and how that is? So that's a really nice piece to 
leave you with around self-awareness. <coughs> Excuse me. Mindfulness. Now, I was always a little bit of a skeptic until probably about, well, not till probably, until about three years ago when um, uh, I went through my separation and mindfulness became very, very clear. It was very clear to me that mindfulness was not part of my life. I had physical exercise and I had work and I had everything else, but I wasn't doing this mindfulness um, piece. And what that takes, it's, it's, um, it can take many, many forms, but it really is for me understanding what works for you as an individual. And it can be anything from yoga to um, Pilates to having um, podcasts in terms of meditation or just sitting um, and in, in the calm and actually creating the space to just be quiet in our mind. So it can be breathing. <clears throat> I've created a whole lot of breathing uh, techniques and uh, for some of the leaders, leadership seminars I do is, okay, so when I'm feeling in that point of anxiety or overwhelm, here's a little five minute thing that I can do in the bathroom, I can do in my car, I can do on the bus, the train, the wherever, just to centre me and have that real clarity around calm. Because when we're in that space, especially when everything around us is chaos, our teams look to us to actually provide that direction. And the more mindful you are, the more present you are because you've created that space to just be. For those of you who are more creative, mindfulness can mean writing. So every morning for me, I'm up at 5 a.m. and that's my time that I'm so disciplined around writing, around um, being present and being clear. So if you haven't put mindfulness into your practice around leadership, then I would um, encourage you to find um, a mode that works for you. And if you go on YouTube, there's plenty of free stuff there that you can just download and go for your life. There's plenty of apps around like Insight Timer, like Calm, that again, you can have on your phone. I think Apple <clears throat> Watches now have um, some of those apps as well. So the key there is what is it that works for you? And secondly, is consistency. It has to be consistent in order to get um, the changes that you need. It's not this thing that you choose to do sometimes. And I promise you, if you add that in and you haven't had that, um, the results for you in terms of how you feel about yourself will be huge. Self-care is a real priority as well. Um, when I'm working with leaders, it seems to be the piece that we get, and we talked a bit about it last week, but we get stuck thinking about what we have to do and helping. And remember, we talked about not fixing others anymore. But self-care is really, what am I doing for me? So it's about putting the oxygen mask on you first as a leader, as a parent, as a uh, partner, whatever that looks like in terms of self-care. Um, am I you know, drinking enough water? Am I doing um, enough physical exercise, whatever that means in terms of that mind-body connection? What are the things that I need to do in my work day that I am not doing for myself? So. I would expect um, as a leader in an organization that you would be spending at least one hour a week actually uh, working and having that time on you in the business. So at least one hour just spending that time looking at what is it that I'm doing in terms of my own leadership development and keeping resilient, yeah? Because once we actually understand where you're at, then we can move forward and we can work on the stuff that's coming to the surface. If you can imagine, if we're too busy doing the doing and we're not taking any care of self, I have this little saying that um, at first um, you get a little tap on your shoulder and um, something will happen in your life and you'll go, oh, and it might be that you get a little bit sick and you're off work or something like that. And you go, okay, right, yep, got that. We'll go back to work and do the same stuff. We go back into that cycle. And then you get a bit of a tap on the head, something more happens. So something a little bit more serious. Again, it can be health related. It can be relationship related. It can be a combination of the above. You take that in your stride, you deal with it, you go back to work. 
And then I talk about the piece of timber that knocks you on the back of the head. Um, and that is something more serious again, it amplifies its intensity. And what that means is, uh, this is where often I see people that go, oh, I tripped over the dog and now my knee is in a brace. Or, you know, I was running and um, something happened. Uh, so it's a little bit more um, serious uh, because it, the, the message is, you know, you need to slow down, right? Or you're doing too much, or you're not delegating enough, or you're not taking enough time and care for yourself. So the worst one that comes after the four by two is the Mack truck, and that will absolutely flatten you. And when I've talked to people who have gone through these things, I've said, did you notice you had these things from the tap on the shoulder and the and the little bit of the knock on the head, et cetera, et cetera. They went, oh my goodness, yes, if I look back at the patterns, but I didn't take enough notice of it. So I promise you in terms of my world, the Mack truck always comes if we're not taking that time to really understand who we are and what we need in order to be, um, you know, uh, work as our best as a partner, as a as a as a parent, as as an as an agile leader, as a as a business person. So positive relationships. I've put that in there because I think this is so important. As we uh, mature in age, it's an age thing, but also a stage thing. I think more in terms of understanding where we're at. Um, we often. Um, can have a load of people around us uh, and some of those relationships aren't great and they can be work relationships and personal relationships. So what we have to make sure uh, when we're looking at, um, at, at these relationships is potentially if we start to look at mindfulness and self-awareness and positive relationships, then sometimes we need to let people go around us because they're no longer, um, we can't fix them. Um, and I was having this conversation with someone the other day that said, you know, um, I have this relationship with this person and I care for them deeply, but I can't do any more for them. And so often what we do for those of us who have that rescuer and fixer mode, and we're consistently looking out for our teams and wanting to do and help and fix, um, what you're actually doing is you're stopping them from um, creating their own journey. So everyone has their own journey in terms of emotional intelligence and emotional personal development journey. And the more that we step in and try and fix that for them, the harder it is for them to take their power back. So if you know that you have some relationships in a team perspective or an organization perspective or a home perspective where uh, we need to do some things around it, my my thing here is to go, sometimes you've got to step back to allow them to step into the space to step up. Because if we've always fixed it for them, then they're so used to us fixing it. Is it going to be hard at the beginning? Absolutely. But after a period of time, it's like training a toddler, it becomes a whole lot easier. So, and it has a big influence on us in terms of resilience. Because often if we're around people, so what I talk about in organisations is, wherever the lowest energy point is of the person coming into the work environment is where everyone will end up going to. So I'm gonna say that again. So everyone, the way that every single person works into an organization every day, whether they come through the front door, the back door, the side door, and I talked about this last week, is a direct correlation to the performance the whole organization gets because um, the culture is made up of individuals who come into this whole environment that um, creates a culture. It's not the business step setting up the cultural rules. It's about individuals coming in and developing and growing and fostering that themselves. And that's a, a real myth that we've got to start to get around. So if we've got a whole bunch of people that are coming in that have quite low energy and really um, negative in terms of some of the way that they're showing up because they've got a whole lot of stuff going on for them, as much and as hard as you try, everyone will be coming back into that lowest energy point over the day, as much as you try to not do that. So that's why we need to really understand and become aware of our own teams um, and where they're at individually and help them in their development models to actually deal with some of those things. 
And the last thing, which I think is the most important here in terms of resilience, is purpose. So it's fascinating to me when I step up, when I, when I have a team of senior leaders around and I say, so tell me what your purpose is here. Tell me what it is in terms of your leadership persona. Tell me what your leadership persona is. Tell me what your identity is, what drives you, what motivates you and what has you bring impactful contribution. And we talked a bit about that last week. And I get these blank looks. It's very difficult for people to really come back to purpose because purpose is driven from here, purpose is driven from here. And often again, it's that thing that we don't think about. We think we are driven by what we do, not who we are. What we do is, is important, absolutely. But who we are and what we bring to the what we do has to start and take primary importance because the more that you own who you are the more powerful you are not from a control perspective but the more um, power you have to make impactful change and contribution so those are the five pillars of resilience that I believe um, are super important around agile leadership and especially coming and using COVID-19 as our little um, leveler here this will have rocked us in some of us for self-awareness and confidence, some of us around the need to do mindfulness because we might have been doing it more now. So it's like if we've been doing that, how do we continue to do that as we, we move back into our normality, the self-care, positive relationships and more importantly purpose. So I'm going to stop for a minute like I did last week and I want you to just jot down for me so where are you thinking? So in terms of your pillars of resilience, I want you to jot down zero out of five beside um, each of those. And um, you can get the, you'll obviously get the slides tomorrow. And then more importantly, so what is it that you want to improve on for yourself in those areas? So I'll give you a minute just to jot that down. Okay, so my request for you is to really start to in your one hour that you're going to put into your week if you haven't done that already or you're not doing that is start addressing some of those and watch your um, action and the way that you are connected to yourself in terms of being more resilient really shift really quickly. Um, so that's that's the five pillars. Okay, what have we got next? Ah, so feeling right now, so that's you. I talk a little bit about emotional, behavioural and physical. So um, at an emotional level, it's like what is your headspace doing? So for some of you, it's going to be totally full, right, of chaos and overwhelm. Some of you, there'll be a behavioural element that um, is, is showing up for you. How come I always getting the same stuff that's happening? And some of you will be a physical, uh, physical thing. It might be like, oh, I'm just getting these headaches all the time, or my shoulder's really sore, or my back is really sore, or my knee, or whatever that is. So I just want you to do a quick check-in point as well around these three things, because this is all tied to resilience as well, right? So if we can get the emotional side in check with the behavioral and the physical, then we're in a making a really good starting point to um, address and become um, hugely resilient. So remember resilient right at the beginning was the ability and energy to bounce back. So it doesn't mean that we have to go through huge trauma um, personally, 
it, it, it can be a minor stressor, but continued minor stresses over a period of time, as we know, we, we know that there's burnout, we know that there's, um, that, you know, stress takes a huge toll in terms of our physical body and that sleep deprivation and working different time zones and all that sort of stuff. So is it, what are we doing in terms of making sure that our body is um, at the emotional, behavioural and physical level is actually um, in tune and we understand more importantly what it means to us. Often I get people saying, oh, I, I should be this and I should be that and I should be this. I'm like, no, you are, it's like you own your body, right? So um, the more in tune we are with ourselves, the more easier it is to actually go, that just doesn't feel right for me to do. And we've got to go with our gut on that, which is really hard for some of us who come from a logic and science elemental background. The great thing about the physical is that it can show from an outer side what's going on and it will reflect the inside. So what I mean by that is if you look at, for example, a shoulder uh, in terms of uh, from an emotional perspective, we'll go I've really sore pain on my shoulder. It's like, um, okay, so where is, what are we doing in terms of carrying all of that around? So what is it that we need to let go of? Because our body's made up of a whole lot of cells that have cellular memory. Really, really important to note that um, whatever we've been through over our 30, 40, 20, 16, 70, 90 years um, is captured in our body. So in order, if we got it in there, we've got to let it, let it go. And um, there's interesting processes around that. So little check for you is where am I at emotionally, behavioural and physically? Am I really happy with that? If you are, fantastic. We're going to go for the next layer up, right? So from good to great. So you know, what is it that I can do to really amplify and go boom, okay, so I want to take it to that next level. And the question then is what am I missing? So this is a really contemplative question and I love that I because often we glean over the stuff, <clears throat> we go, oh yeah, I've got time for that. Oh yeah, no, I need to do that. But it's that kind of tiny little thing, that voice in your head. Some of you have a voice in your head, some of you have a little um Thing that tells you or your gut tells you or you're seeing stuff but you're kind of not addressing it because you're choosing not to do that so what are the things that you're missing and that you know that you perhaps need to pick up on so again when you have that hour working on yourself I want you to start going there and writing so for those of you who are writers um, what what is really good to do here is you can sit there and go put the timer on for two minutes because I'm a quick, fast sort of get through stuff. Um, and you can go, I wonder what it would feel like if I didn't have la 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 la, right? I wonder what I'd feel like if, and you answer that, put on for two minutes and just see what comes up in terms of your writing and it's going to be there for you. So if you're trying to extrapolate through the chaos in your head or your brain that's going, there's a million things to do and you're feeling quite overwhelmed or there's anxiety or you're feeling a bit down or there's stuff going on for you, then um, that's a really nice starting point. And, I, and if you do that for a week, you're going to clear some of the stuff from your head. We've got to get it out of here because that actually helps release it from the rest of the place. So what are you missing? Okay, cool. So um, I talked a bit last week about thinking, right? The thinking model that I um, put in place. Um, and I'm going to really take you through this because I love using this when we're looking to get change, right? So we have, any time we want to change something, we have this locked in thinking, which is, um, I only know this way, so this is what I've learned, this is what I know that works or doesn't work. So it's pretty much locked in in our thinking um, modality. So what I wanna do is go, okay, so for example, let's use COVID-19, it's come in, throwing us around, and we have to challenge the way perhaps that we're working. And I come back to, again, the concept around this is, fits really nicely. Am I doing the work I love um, with the people I like, the way I like, right? So if we look at the way I like, 
what COVID's done in a way is, is helped us to go, if I take my physical location out because now I'm working more remotely or I'm doing stuff differently, what is it that I can do to unlock the locked in thinking? How can we change stuff that's been working really well since COVID's happened? Because as we talked about last week, there's been increases in productivity, there's been increases in efficiency, and there's been increases in connection. So how do we keep that going when we move the physical location back, say for example, if everyone's been working remotely and we're back in the office? So what is it that we need to do to unlock our locked in thinking? So when we get to that unlock space, it's like that's the creation space, right? So then we can innovate to be way more efficient and do things differently, and then we can smart produce some new stuff. And so my thinking around resilience is we have this locked in thinking that um, uh, now I'm back at level, uh, sorry, you're level three or stage three, or you know when you move to four in normality, so we can't just go back to the way things were because we've got to make some changes, yeah? So what are those things that work really well for us? So let's unlock our locked in thinking, and then we can innovate from there, and then we can smart produce um, some new stuff that's really cool in terms of um, leadership or organization models or whatever it is that we're trying to do. So really nice model to start thinking about, particularly around resilience and team and connection and um, really um, using, for example, the COVID experience as, and there'll be other experiences in your organization right now, especially if you've got clients around the world, which you do, and you're not able to travel to those restricted countries uh, to do the work that you're doing. So what is it that you're doing around that? So, um, and for me, this, um, interestingly enough, the unlock locked in thinking is, um, COVID's allowed me to work so much more globally online because um, we're needing to do that and people have come up with breakout rooms and, and a whole lot of really cool features, innovative features around ability to connect and do work online and that's just, a, that's just one example. Okay, next one. Oh, I love this. This is one of my favourites, right? So in terms of leading in uncertainty and resilience, here's what you need to know about yourself, right? Your brain is a projector. So every day that you get up, you play, in my terms, you play a movie. And the movie that you play in your head, I don't mean that you're playing Spider-Man or um, some romantic love story. It's about the story that you tell yourself when you wake up. So whatever it is that you are thinking or feeling about yourself and the world is going to film your thinking and screen your life back to you. So basically what that means is that if I wake up and I say to myself, um, I am a terrible mother, just use that for an example, I'm not, I'm fantastic, but if I use that for an example, I would find evidence everywhere because I'm filming that thinking and that thought pattern and that belief structure, I would find evidence everywhere to prove that, right? So people would start saying to me things around challenging me and my motherhood status. Same as if I got up and I am like, I am not valued in this organization. So when I go to work, walk in the door, I will find evidence everywhere that's perceived evidence because it might not be the truth that I am not valued in this organization. So if we want to understand if you can think of resilience as being um, coming back from a whole bunch of stresses that have been in our way, at times, we can be the stressor, which is kind of odd, but we're stressing ourselves out, right? So we're in the cycle doing this to ourselves, creating what we're creating, using the evidence around us to come back. So in order to really understand that, one of the things when you're working on your own is going, what are my patterns? As a leader, when I walk into my organization, 
What is it that I'm thinking, feeling? What is it that I'm being portrayed back? So if you actually have a really good look around and you're in tune with that lens on, um, you can find gold in there because those are the patterns that you're being that you will be seeing um, come back to you. When I go in and do discovery assessments in the work environment, I'll sit with the CEO or the senior leadership team and I'll go, here's here's what we've observed, here's, here's what's going on. And they go, how did you actually see that? It's absolutely there. You can absolutely see it when you put that lens on. Because remember, we're not focused on what we're doing, we're focused on what's around us in terms of uh, the team. And when we get to the gold nuggets, that's where the power is in terms of change. So whatever uh, I often get, um, there's this hamster wheel thing going on where, um, Everyone is just so busy doing their stuff, but there's no, and, and there's just more and more conflicting priorities coming in, and there's just more and stress being um, there, and then we've got, um, you know, people that aren't communicating, and we've got some toxicity over here in terms of dysfunctional people that won't talk to each other, and and um, and so what can happen here is, um, from a leadership perspective, they'll go, well, I don't know how to fix it. We've just got a lot of stuff going on. We actually have to stop and look at what is, what are the patterns? What are the movies? What are we doing here at a leadership level that's creating that? And often we find it could be that at a leadership level, we're coming together and we've got our own silos that we're protecting. So I might be sales and I might be operations and I might be marketing. And I'm bringing that into these leadership meetings which is driving this silo-based um, behaviour instead of coming in and working at the organisation or on the organisation as a whole in terms of um, looking at the overall health of it. So it's a really key concept to come back to go around resilience and agile leadership. What are the patterns? What are the patterns that are filming the thinking that are screening back to us? So this is life, individual and also organisation-wide. So what we have to do is we've got to interrupt the cycle. So first we've got to find the patterns. I'm going to do a little bit more on this next week because next week's about observational intelligence as a framework. It's going to teach you how to do that. But a patterns is a series of something, right? A series of behaviours, series of incidences, series of something. So the patterns, um, when we understand what the patterns are, we have to interrupt the cycle because we go, okay, well, the patterns aren't working for us in terms of um, what we're doing, or we need to change some stuff up if, if it has been working well and take it to the next level, let's look at the patterns again. So there'll be a series of triggers, and then if we de-layer it back or unlayer it, the triggers are there. So the trigger is I am triggered by something. So it can be a person, a situation, the environment, as we talked about before, or ourselves, we can trigger ourselves. And basically underlying that is there's an unmet expectation. So if we can get really present on what the unmet expectation is, we can unlearn that behavior and relearn something else. So when we get the pattern right, we understand the trigger, we really get clear on the unmet expectation, we can unlearn and relearn it. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of an example here. So someone is showing up that was quite resilient um, perhaps um, in the last uh, four months with everything else going on, um, the, uh, uh, the way that they're showing up has changed significantly, right? So you've observed that. And when you've tried to address it, they've gone, yep, no, everything's cool, absolutely fine, right? So the trigger could be that, just use this as an easy example, that um, this particular person really enjoys being in the work environment and since COVID has had to work from home. And what that's mean working from home is that um, they don't feel connected, they're feeling isolated and they haven't got, um, they're just not feeling, they're feeling discombobulated, right? And so what that's done for them is it's triggered them. So working from home has been the trigger. And what that's meant is that all the things right at that slide at the beginning around tool mentor, around um, feeling um, valued in the organization is coming up because perhaps where they've had a really good close connection uh, with their manager or with you or with others, 
um, that's kind of um, been eliminated or, or stopped and they've really, in order to keep them going, have actually um, lived for those. So the trigger is um, is maybe working from home. The unmet expectation is they no longer they don't feel valued um, working. And so what they're doing is they're working harder and harder and harder and doing more and more and more and feeling more and more burnt out. Um, and then it's not sustainable because they've got home and all this other stuff going on. And so the unmet expectation is I'm not valued. And so the movie that they play everywhere is they're finding evidence to prove that, right? So you, all you see is this person that was highly confident and really happy to now this person that is not confident and not happy. So when we get really clear that you understand what the unmet expectation is, I'm not valued, then you can start to unlearn and relearn that. So it's a really easy process. And we'll talk about this next week around the framework of how do I interrupt the cycle and get them present to that's what's going on for them in terms of being agile leaders. Because remember, when we're inspiring, empowering and serving them and we're helping them to actually develop as individuals, then that's that's the great stuff around agile leadership. So just to um, look at that again, you're going to look at the patterns, understand what the triggers are, um, what's the unmet expectations, what can be unlearned and relearned. Yeah, so start to look at that across the business and at an individual level and actually for yourself. So those in terms of resilience, when we come from the bottom up, that's an easy place to start. Okay, so the seven C's of resilience. I uh, love this um, because actually I was reading some of his work, um, Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg. He does a lot working with... Um, uh, children who are unwell actually and dealing with um, parents and children going through a process and what I loved about his work is I went oh my goodness we can actually adapt those for the workplace and resilience because it actually fits across um, leadership it fits across with our teams and individual and team levels so I've just adapted them for our um, for the purpose of resilience in organizations so if we look at the first one um, and the first one is control so control is about um, for me control around resilience is being able to control ourselves so when we have something like let's use COVID again because it's easy COVID comes in um, it stirs everything up we've got to control um, what we can, right? So in order to be resilient, um, we can only control our piece of it. We can't fix the whole community piece out here. We can do our bit towards it, but we can, we're only in control of what we can control. And I think often what happens when we get in the state of trauma or high stress is that we try to overcompensate and control in other areas. So in terms of leadership, it's it's kind of like, okay, it's, it's trying to put a band-aid fix across all the areas that perhaps are, <laughs> need, need plugging, all the gaps that need plugging. So I think if we come back to really understand what it is that's in our control and we can control, that's going to be a really good start versus trying to fix everything. So bring it back to just here. The second is confidence, right? So remember we, when we're triggered and we're faced with um, situations that are creating this ability to not be resilient, confidence is gonna be the overarching one that stands here, right? So when we are confident or have confidence, it's the first thing that goes when we're triggered. So for some of us, confidence can go when things change right so that resistance to change we hear all the time right are oh, they resistant to change my team are resistant to change it's just that we've got to look at things in a different way we all think and process information and we all behave in a different way when change happens have I taken them on the journey in the way that they need to be in the way that they need to hear it. So we'll go, yeah, I've taken them on the journey. Yes, I've given them the vision and the purpose and I've talked about what I want them to achieve, but they haven't heard it. And I haven't checked that they've heard it. So if I don't have an understanding of where I fit 
and what I'm trying to do and what my purpose is and where I'm, 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 I'm in the space here, then confidence is gonna be the first thing that goes because people like, as I said last week, generally people come to work to do a great job. They're not there to not do that. So when we get rocked and we see confidence coming up, it's because there's an unmet expectation and we haven't quite got that right. Or there's this, um, this the, we've got all this emotional stuff that's coming to the surface. So coping. Coping is a really nice one. And especially now as we're coming back into, as you say, you're coming back into normality. Um, and there'll be some fear-based stuff around that. Um, how do I, you know, how do I, lots of how do I's, how do I, how will it work? What will that look like? How will I feel? What if I meet someone else? What if I get on, uh, you know, is, there's a lot of this, um, we've lived in the world of, of COVID in terms of being, um, you know, in this isolation or um, secure space over here, and now I'm coming and integrating back in. So how am I going to cope? And um, some of your guys that you will have noticed, or some of your team, individual members, this is where, as an agile leader, um, you should be really understanding what makes them tick and, and understanding how to get them through that process, right? So um, giving them some good strategies around coping mechanisms to do that is um, absolutely uh, paramount as you um, starting that transition back. So I'd be starting that process now in terms of getting them really clear and, and talking to them and understanding what's in the way for them. Because remember what I said last week, what stands in the way is the way until you shift it. I'll say that again, what stands in the way is the way until you shift it. So, um, so that's coping. Competence. Competence is around when I feel that I know what I'm doing, <laughs> I'm gonna be really competent, right? So my behavior is going to drive my competence. So often when I get asked to come in, when there's some issues around behaviors and the people, aren't, um, people in capability aren't quite sure how to deal with it. So I'll come in and I'll go, the first question I'll ask is behavior driving competency or competency driving behavior? So that's a really interesting way to look at it. Is competence driving behavior or behavior driving competence? Because if it's incompetence, then there's a really easy path around training and education, right? If it's behavioral based, we've got to look wider under the hood. So we've got to go in and go, so what's going on to have these behaviors um, sort of take over uh, from a competence perspective? And so when we feel competent, we feel confident, we cope, and we're in control. And so it's about really understanding from a competence perspective, you know, am I, am I really sure, do I understand your expectations of me as a leader? Do you actually, am I actually delivering what you want? And so it comes back to you as leaders to go in terms of resilience, being able to adjust and change and innovate and, and unlock that locked in thinking to help them uh, with that. Character is really important. That comes back to purpose for me. So character is, you know, when we have a team and we can actually look across our team and go, you know what, out of all my team, they are all really comfortable and confident with who they are. And secondly, what they do, the work will be, will be doing your best work. So you will have a high performing team. If character is missing, then what you have is a team that's just focused on doing. And that's where you keep, you'll probably get frustrated because you go, I can't get them sometimes to engage. I can't get this high level of connection. I can't, I can't, I can't, there's something missing and I don't know what it is. That's what's missing. And then have a look at yourself and go, okay, so in terms of you, what are you doing in that space? So how are you showing up? Because remember the movie camera, the movie that you play, your brain's a projector and you're screening your life. And contribution is really important, right? So is people want to make a contribution in their working world. So are you allowing them the space and place and time and um, development to actually feel like they are bringing and making impactful contribution across the organization? So, I mean, I really love those, right? So control, confidence, coping, competence, connection, character, and contribution, if we can have all of those kind of pillars right with our own self-awareness, purpose, peace going over here,
boom, we've got some really nice combinations of ways to help deal and drive um, resilience, especially now as you're moving into your stage, um, stage three. So um, when we look at then step up a layer, right, and we look at, and I'm just giving you a whole lot of different tools today. So um, resilient leadership is really important, but what is resilient leadership? So again, I've given you some little um, easy tools and processes here, and there's a lot more detail behind them, but I'm happy to take any questions and, and, and go into more detail. Um, you can just email me. Um, Design is really, really important first. So in your time that you're going to, that you're choosing to spend on yourself, resilient leadership, okay? So the first piece is you've got to design from the heart and the head. So often what we've talked about is head is uh, all that logic stuff and heart is we're gonna go back into heart-based leadership. I believe that you've got to have a combination of both of them. So the head brings you that really smart um, understanding around performance and structure and business and direction and all of that stuff. Um, and heart brings that emotional intelligence, that observational awareness intelligence, a lot of that um, empathy or some of those you know those other words that are used quite a bit so those softer skills so it's about source right i call it source s-o-u-r-c-e source so when we design from heart and head then that's the start of resilience because remember all of the heart-based stuff is everything that we've just gone through to here to the slide, right? So Deloitte um, published this in March, right? Especially around um, some of the COVID stuff. There was an article that they did around um, resilient leadership and looking across the world, um, the US and uh, afar and looking at some larger and smaller organizations in terms of what were the key critical skills around resilient leadership, especially as um, COVID was hitting. So you need to put your miss mission first. Um, so what that means is with something uh, in terms of a crisis mode, right? So you've got to put your mission first. So create this almost, um, you've got to go from triage to um, to actually getting some, um, some structure going, right? So really quickly go, okay, so what is it that we're, what, we, what are we trying to achieve now? So put your mission first, look at the triage piece that you need around your people, around talent, around um, you know uh, supply chain, around all of those things. What is it that you need to do um, differently? Um, uh, and I love this one. So we've got to aim for speed rather than perfection. So some of you will be observing this now. It's in order to keep my business or this organization going, what is it that we need to do differently really quickly? And often for people that um, are perfectionists and have this high need for structure and compliance and accuracy and factual, um, that can get in the way of speed because speed sometimes means imperfect data. And imperfect data for those that have highly logical, structured, analytical, factual, compliant based uh, leadership nature is going to create some challenges, right? So, um, but we have to move quickly in terms of getting uh, what it is that we need to, to deliver. And this is where you, as a resilient leader, actually comes in and this is the process that you put in place in terms of the movie that you play. Um, you need to own the story. Um, and if I look back in New Zealand, and it's a difference between, um, how do we um, how do we keep going or not? We we can't look to others to fix this, right? Again, come back to here. We can only control what we can control. So we've got to own the story that we want to tell um, uh, our teams, um, our people, our customers, our whoever, right? So there's got to be some transparency around the baseline and the current baseline and reality. So when you own that story, guess what? In terms of resilient leadership and your team connection is huge. Um, and then embrace, embrace the long view. So the long view for me is coming back to 
well, okay, we've got a new a new normal now, or we don't even have a new normal yet, because even even in New Zealand, even though we we have we've been operating in a normal sort of sphere, we still have limited um, border uh, we have border closures still. But um, embracing the long view is like okay, so uh, what I've started to see happen is you know people are buying a lot more New Zealand made products. So how do we innovate and make our um, our products more readily available in house? How do we um, for all the international tourism that come that used to come here and obviously lots of places around uh, the country have um, been incredibly um, challenged with no tourists. How do we how do we change that? So by quickly uh, camper vans and you know um, school holidays have just been and gone. So um, you know camper van deals and special deals for holidays and just coming and thinking th like coming back at unlocking that locked and thinking. So embracing that long view around um, what does our new world look like and what can we do right now that's going to keep us keep us going and um, and give us the um, the ability to to start to think about things differently. So design from heart and head. Put your mission first. So get get your triage sorted. Understand what that is and what needs your baseline. Aim for speed over uh, perfection. Own the story. Be highly transparent. No, no, it doesn't mean you need to tell people everything, but it's about being visible around what you're doing and the realities of the world and embrace the long view. Um, those are some key key areas there. So um, counterbalanced with um, so what what does this actually mean? Um, so if I'm just going to move this over here. Um, so again, I'm going to start with this bit here. You need to um, launch your your command center for crisis, then support your talent and strategy. You know, maintain your business continuity and financing. So um, in terms of resilient leadership. It's really around, um, you know, what does business continuity look like? What is it that we need to do around the financing, the financial models right now? Tighten that supply chain. So again, where are the areas? What do we need to do in there? You need to keep engaged with clients and communicate with them and connect with them and making sure that, you know, remember your job is to inspire, empower and serve, serve those. Um, your clients are those who you serve. So, you know, what is it that you're doing around them? Are they okay? Where is it that you can help? Where can I add value? How can I add value? How can I add value? How can I add value, right? Strengthen digital capabilities. It's very clear that the world is changing. How do we how do we do that stuff differently in construction, right? So what are the new innovative ways that we can actually work in our industry without being on site? Um, and so one of the um, I've been working with a local government uh, down the line, down, right down the bottom of the South Island, and um, they still have with water and waste and uh, some of the other services there. So what they were doing is having one person out in the field but they created really quickly an app that they could actually measure and do what they needed to do without having um, to um, have two or three people go out with them and a lot of that stuff was was driven um, from car from the car so it's about where can we strengthen our digital capabilities and create that Un and, and unlock that locked in thinking to actually keep things progressing in the best way we can around um, the areas we can um, and engage your business ecosystem. So this is where the power of collective power is better than an individual. So you can keep your own stuff but engage in your own business ecosystem and see what others are doing in this space as well to understand and help and engage there. So those are some more um, tactical uh, pieces around a sort of business, um, the business resilience as well. So, um, code black swan. Um, I think this is really important, um, and it seems to be. I don't know whether you've heard of this. I hadn't heard of it, but um, quite liked it. So, when we have a code black swan, basically, what is that? What that means is how do we prepare for another COVID, right? So. Uh, it's very clear that our world is changing and it's resetting itself on a new path. So um, there will be something else. So going through this experience 
should, if we don't come out of this um, uh, resilient and agile in terms of the way that our businesses work, then um, we probably need to rethink why we're in business. But um, Code Black Swan is, so what is it that we need to do differently? So what do we unlearn and relearn in terms of coming out of this so that we are fully prepared for whatever that next uh, black swan event is or that crisis? Because um, I think what's what's clear is, uh, you know, this is the way that um, uh, things are, are going to evolve, uh, whether that's a, a huge weather um, or environment thing, or whether it's a, another um, pandemic or whatever that looks like, I guess we don't know. And that's where we need to start to make sure in our crisis command centre that we set up, that we're actually documenting all that and helping in people. And our people now, when we're coming back in, it's not just going back to how it was. We're actually keeping them resilient, developing their resilient skills by keeping that stuff going and developing them as we come out of this process. And people have come through it thinking a lot more, I've found, around making significant changes to their life. If I look now, a lot of people that I am working with or people that have approached me for you know, one-to-one -one coaching have gone, okay, this, is, this experience is, has made me want to deal with my stuff or it's made me realise now that I want uh, to do something different. Um, I'm going to give this up and I want this or I want more of that. And I think that's a really nice thing if we're actually doing that and we're connected with our teams is, so what is it that you have um, learnt? What is it that you want to do more of or less of? Where are the games, the gaps and the losses, which is what we talked about last week. So identify what the process is for your next black swan is the purpose of that slide. So um, just if we're getting to the end, so science or emotional judgment. So we talked a little bit about that um, earlier on. Is it perceived or real, right? So you've got to remember that um, Here's the thing, if we are playing a movie every day that has us believe in our own mind that stuff is happening out there, but it's actually based on our judgment, it's purely perception. It's highly personalized and it's not real. So the distinction around resilience and understanding um, the emotional side is, is it person? Am I personalizing this? And we get a lot of this around communication. So if you've got some communication, some interesting communication um, dynamics uh, in your organization, I hazard a guess that the majority of them will be because there's this high level of perception. It's not real and it's highly personalized, right? But in our mind, we think it's real. So um, it's like this stuff is happening to me and it's this person that's doing it to me. It's highly personalized, right? But actually, it is that I am in my emotional space of I'm seeing the world in that lens and, I'm, and, and it's become personalized because I'm in a, um, in a heightened emotional trigger state. And that's how my emotional judgment reads it versus the science around it is it's depersonalized, it's real and it's perspective. So I teach a lot around perception versus perspective and trigger based um, behaviors. So when it's real and depersonalized, there, there's no emotion in it, but it still can be an emotional topic, if that makes sense. So I guess when we come to the rounding of this, we've got to go, okay, so what is it, where do I live a lot of the time? So, because often if you've got to think about it, if we're, if we're screening that movie every day, we're telling ourselves that we're looking for evidence, we think it's real. But actually we've got to go down to the resilience path because this piece here in the not real side will be a key driver in, um, in emotional um, trigger and resilience. So that'll be creating this ongoing stressor or stressors or trauma that is coming up for us around the stuff that we need to deal with versus that real 
perspective depersonalized um, behavioral type. So as leaders, again, if you're doing all the way back to your resilience piece at the front, the self-care, the self-awareness, the purpose, all of that stuff, you're gonna be in a far better state to be in this perspective depersonalized real state. Um, so just to, to finish up, um, we've got to understand people and perspective. So if we take that down a layer, so with the people, we've got to understand our individual's resilience factors. And yes, um, whilst you're not going to fix it for them, there is a um, there is a need for you as a leader to understand their resilience factors. And if you are developing them through their personal development, professional development path, and understand what those are, that would be part of that, I would expect. Um, and that's about fostering resilience type um, of conversations. Um, they're real conversations, they're regular conversations, and they're responsive type conversations. Because the more real, the more regular, and the more responsive, the better you understand your individual, the better you understand your team, the more you're going to get from them because they are highly in tune with themselves, you are highly in tune with yourself, right? So I question there, my question is where are you um, at in understanding your individual's resilience needs and factors and especially now as you're integrating back into, again start those conversations now with them as you're moving into stage three. <coughs> Excuse me, perspective ask better questions. Um, it blows me away when I'm walking into organisations and I go, well, I tell them, I've told them, I've told them seven times, I tell them, I told them, right? We've got to ask better questions because telling for people that are highly analytical, factual, doesn't help or, or need a high um, uh, sense of um, social interaction because their um, people outgoing um, score and their profile is high. We've got to start asking better questions to ensure that our expectations that we've set are very clear. When we get better questions, we get better output people feel a bit more connected and we're getting better progress, right? So develop, unlearn, relearn opportunities. So we've got to go, and we'll go through that in more depth next week, but develop, unlearn and relearn opportunities is there. So people in perspective, where are you at with that would be my question and your time that you're going to spend on your own. Um, so we've got your patterns, you've got a set of behaviour, then you're going to create some actions, that you want out of it and some outcomes. And again, we'll use this next week, but to start looking at resilience and the areas around yourself and your leadership and your teams. Okay, what are the patterns we're seeing? Remember the set of behaviors that are driving that pattern. What are the actions you're, uh, what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve? And then what actions do you need to put in place to get you through that process? Um, and, I think, ah, I love this, whatever it takes is what I love because right now more than ever, um, we kind of have to own as leaders in our organisations, we have to do whatever it takes. And if we're not prepared to do that, then, you know, that's a really interesting discussion because there's a lot of people out there who have been through a lot of trauma and whatever that means, it could be a minor trauma compared to others, doesn't matter, it's still the feeling that, that they have in terms of their resilience and their resilience is um, diminished. And so it's our job as leaders not to fix them, but to get them present to how do we um, give them the tools to help them be okay with where they're at and help them shift into a space of um, from uncertainty um, and not being resilient to actually really coming out of this. And if we come back to the model, unlock their locked in thinking and get them innovative thinking and get them smart producing, smart producing, which is where we need to do so. I love it because I, I sort of use this a lot. Am I doing whatever it takes? When I get up every morning, Am I doing whatever it takes today in terms of my purpose in the world, on the planet, whatever that is, to actually um, move forward in that direction? So have a little think about whatever it takes for you as leaders. And I think I've left one last quote here. I love Steve Maraboli. Life doesn't get easier or more, um, 
um, what is it? I can't remember, I need to move this here, sorry, or more forgiving, yeah, it is forgiving. Um, we just get stronger and more resilient. So um, I hope that's helped today. Um, there's a whole lot of concepts I've just thrown in there for you, a lot of tools, a lot of things to think about. Um, and again, happy to take any questions, info at paradigmshift.co.nz after you've had a chance to reflect on this. Um, and I think um, I'll just move across to you um, Billy, now. Okay, that was great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, so, um, we have a few questions. Um, yes. So, sure. uh, <laughs> uh, resilience is very often interpreted through the lens of an old leadership paradigm. This is a paradigm that expects leaders to be superhuman, to immediately have all the answers, to be perfect, strong, never fail, and never give up. It expects leaders to be tough no matter what they're experiencing inside and encourages them to never show any sign of weakness. This uh, hasn't brought us the best results. Uh, leaders of today are uh, being invited to stop trying to fulfill the old paradigm that encourages them to be ultra rigid in their efforts to show resiliency and uh, instead understand with flexibility and fluidity um, that comes the strength to get back on course and be truly resilient. So in saying this, um, uh, there are a lot of discussions on uh, vulnerability that is supposed to be a part of resilience. And that the part of vulnerability sometimes seems to be interpreted uh, by different people differently. And um, uh, some people perceive it as a weakness. So mm. how do you see that vulnerability? You know, where is the fine line that I suppose it's, it, it, it's not an easy question, but where is that fine line where, you know, we show that we, we are human, um, we we show empathy, uh, you know, we show that we are not bulletproof, but that is not perceived as weakness, as, uh, as um, uh, a lack of uh, uh, leadership skills. Yeah, that's a really um, interesting question and there's probably two parts to that. So I'm going to sort of come to that from the um, leaders are superhuman, right? Yeah. I can't come back to that and I go, um, if we understand, because um, if we understand who we are and we own who we are, like I've talked about at the beginning, like we have our own leadership persona, right? And we're really connected to ourselves and therefore that's showing up because we, I can walk into a room and tell um and every leader in the room exactly how um, what their lead, I should be able to what their leadership persona is and how comfortable and confident they are. If we come back to all the research around um, softer skills, let's call them soft skills. Um, I think what people have done in the past is go, I need to be superhuman and do all this stuff. No, you need to be real and be yourself because the more you are those you are doing um, vulnerability and you are doing um, transparency and you are connecting because people can connect to that real versus that perceived superhuman um, quality as I can't do anything wrong, right? I can't fail. Um, uh -huh. I'm not a believer of that at all because I believe that the more transparent and visible you are, um, and if you fail, you fail fast, it creates and fosters a great team environment that allows them to do exactly the same. Because remember, you are the mirror. So whatever you're trying to achieve is going to be screened back to you. So the vulnerability and courage, and I know Brené Brown does some cool work in this space, but um, for me, vulnerability is, uh, there, there is a grey line because I think um, you need to have courage to talk about the stuff that doesn't get talked about. So yeah. it's the, 
white elephant, pink elephant, blue elephant in the room. It's the culture stuff. It's the individual behaviours that need addressing. It's about actually courage and being brave enough to tackle the topics of, um, I don't know, bullying or some of those things that traditionally are like, well, I'm just going to fix it or hide it or um, not do anything about it, but I'm going to be over here doing this stuff because I can't be seen to be doing that. Again, I think um, uh, there's a vulnerability as a word that um, that I don't tend to use in my leadership personas because um, I think it scares people a lot in terms of I need to go bleh. <laughs> so I need to yeah. tell them all about yeah, my exactly. life and all about my stuff, yes. right? Yeah. No. <laughs> you need <laughs> to do some of that, and but do it in a power, right at the beginning, I talked about that powerful way. So go, so, you know, guys, when I was um, blah, 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 and the learning that I had from that was there, you know, it's not like I've had, you know, five relationships that have gone pear shape and it's created all this stuff and I'm, I've got all this stuff going on in my world and I just want to share it with you. Uh, no, because yes. that, becomes, that becomes icky and it's not a great space to be. And then you're starting to try and get on side with them as a cheerleader type leader versus actually a leader who understands themselves to the point that they can engage, that they can interact, that people can connect to because they're real. So if I change vulnerability to being real and being able to see and share what they want to share, but not, you know, spilling their whole world on the carpet because that just allows other people to go, I don't know whether I trust this person. Does this person actually know what they're doing? And so it's it's kind of like that's the element of science and the emotional, the good judgment of emotion, right? And yeah. and that, it's that fine line of, you know, we don't get it right all the time and that's okay. And we have personal stuff that goes on and that's okay. It's how yes. do we back, you know, how do we bounce back from that? No one is super superhuman. I'd love to be superhuman, but we're not. And so if we can fail fast and be real and transparent, then I think that's what I want when I'm creating leadership programs with my guys is around uh, work on site is around what is your persona, what is that contribution, that purpose, that's going to bring you um, a really nice um, balance, if that makes sense. Hopefully that answered that. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, thank you very much because that's that vulnerability. It's it it, it is something that uh, I suppose you you can mention that that word only uh, uh, understanding and knowing well uh, the other parties that you are discussing it with because it can easily be taken to crying um, and all all uh, all different uh, different things. Okay, uh, so uh, emotion and crying is another one, right? Yeah. So emotion is like, uh, you know, and let's face it, women are perceived to be emotional. Uh, women are wired differently to men and how we have the conversation has to be um, prepared for, which we talked a bit about last week. It's like, if I know that the person that I'm going to deal with with this particular issue is going to respond in a way, why do we keep doing the same process that has the same result? Let's try it a different way. Prepare for a conversation that has it land differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, we are getting close to the time, uh, but I just want to want to uh, um, uh, a couple of uh, quick questions, and then the rest of the questions we will answer um, uh, later. Uh, offline and send the, send the answers. Um, you talked uh, you talked uh, earlier about how do how do we identify or understand the resilience in uh, our teams and individuals. You talked about asking the right questions. In asking the right questions, I suppose, uh, and I will give you my perception of that. Mm -hmm. uh, if I understand the uh, experience, age, gender, uh, culture, uh, that will help me more to ask good questions. Uh, what, what, what else you would uh, sort of um, include in the mix to ensure that that we are asking effective questions? And um, and that we are going to get a response without 
uh, being perceived that we are intruding in something that's none of our business, especially if we talk about, you know, the the emotional stuff and uh, something that uh, that's happening outside of work. Um, uh, what would be your advice there? Yeah, cool. And um, we're going to cover some of that next week in the observational intelligence framework one because um, that comes up a lot, and a lot of it is around how do I prepare the conversation, right? So um, we, you, you're right in terms of you can't start those <laughs> start the conversation. Hey, Billy. So I've really noticed that you know you're really depressed in the last uh, three weeks. Can you tell me what's going on? Um, if I've really yeah, not had no, that. <laughs> with you before, right? It's probably not likely to go. I've observed that you've done this, this, and this, and here's my patterns. And um, what do you think about that? You know, it's probably not likely going to land in the right way. But but what we can do is start the process when you're working on your. So so it's like working on your team. It's just like you work on your business rather than in it. So you're working on this particular individual, and you're going. So what am I seeing and observing? So what are the things that that drive them, what are the changes, what are the patterns, what are the patterns, what are the patterns? And then come to the outcome that you're trying to achieve. So if it's about, and we'll run through this in more detail next week, if it's about I'm trying to get them to, um, that they've, they've turned up and they're really, I used to use that one, really de depressed and they're not confident and everything's gone haywire, then come back and start to do the pattern work yourself and then go, what am I trying to achieve? So when we get the outcome right, this is where people get it a little bit confused because they'll go, okay, I'm going into help, I'm going to go fix, 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 Crusader, fix, 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 Bando fix, what's going on, tell me, tell me, tell me. But actually if we look at the patterns, why they happened, what might have, when, when it started, and then come to what am I trying to achieve from an outcome, then we can put the journey of the how together, which is, and it's the how in terms of the framing up of the questions that I'll take um, you guys through next week in terms of some of the observational um, intelligence framework. So, um, and, and a, a sense of how do I ask better questions? Um, and generally it's not that yes, no answer. We've got to really think outside of that. So yeah, hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you. And uh, let's do a quick one, last one. You have asked us earlier to rate ourselves, um, you know, in, in, in doing the self-awareness thing, to rate uh, our emotional, physical, mental uh, uh, state well-being. And if the if, uh, scores zero to five, if the scores are less than five uh, uh, in certain areas, how do we start working on that? Because obviously, you know, nobody wants to be less than five, or at least more than five. Um, so, so what is the starting point there? Or if we had all fives, how do we go from good to great? Perfect. So I would really challenge anyone that had all fives. <laughs> Point number one. <laughs> Because I would say that you'll probably need uh, a whole lot of work in all of your areas, right? <laughs> so then take your glasses off and put them on again through a different lens. Ask a different question, right? So anyone that would come up with all fives, I would I would say go back and do it again, right? Because <laughs> actually, if we're really connected to ourselves right now. I guarantee some of us might have close to five, but some of us, and it's okay, it doesn't matter what the zero, if it's zero, it's absolutely fantastic, right? So, um, and zero is about starting the process in the area. So I'd go and ask the question again and go, so if it's um, purpose, that's an easy one, right? If I've got zero, I have no idea what my purpose is, then that's a really nice starting point to go, okay, so when I take my time on my own, I'm going to really go and explore purpose. So I might look up Simon Sinek stuff around the power of the why. I might go and Google what is actually his purpose, you know, or I might talk to Rebecca or someone else around that that can actually help me understand how to get to my purpose. There's a bunch of stuff online in terms of podcasts, in terms of uh, free stuff on YouTube. Simon Sinek's perfect. So I would go, okay, so my goal 
is to figure out what my purpose is. Now that's a kind of a big-ish conversation and we won't get that right all the time, but I'm gonna go from a zero to a three. So a three might look like for me that I'm actually confident that I have my purpose that is the right one for me and three to five is I'm actually living my purpose because we can't go from zero today and five tomorrow. Yep, got my purpose, I'm sweet, it's all good. Because unless you're really highly uh, tuned, that's gonna take a little bit of time. Something like a self-care thing though, go, I don't drink any water whatsoever throughout the day. I only drink, I don't know, 10 cups of coffee. That's a real quick win, right? So that is in self-care, what are the things that I need to put in place to get me from a zero to a five? And what does five look like? Five might be, I'm gonna do a half marathon next year in June. So I'm gonna start my training process or I'm gonna do some, go to sleep at, you know, uh, instead of going to sleep at 2 a.m., I'm gonna to go to sleep at 10. So what are the things that I need to put in place? What does the journey look like? What's the how to get me from zero or three to five? Um, and if you do have a five that's there uh, around, um, for example, uh, self-awareness, um, then the potential to further develop, because self-awareness further develop is huge. Okay, so if I'm really here at five as an agile leader across my business, where do I need to go to get someone to take me from five to five plus? Yeah, mm -hmm. and that'll be taken right out of your comfort zone to um, drive and, and develop that. Yeah, excellent, Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, to all of our attendees, um, I wish to thank Rebecca for her, uh, for dedicating her time and, um, and expertise again to us uh, this evening and for this captivating, informative, insightful, and thought-provoking session. So thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this is our certificate of appreciation for this evening. Thank so um, uh, again, I will uh, brief you. Um, we have the following, um, the last, uh, webinar from the Agile Leadership Series uh, next Wednesday, How to Lead Powerfully Using Observational Intelligence uh, with Rebecca again. Um, in August, we will have um, a seminar on uh, construction claims during and after COVID-19. Um, of course, I have to mention NAWIC membership. If you are not already a member, please join us. Uh, the details for membership uh, you will find on our website, uh, www.nawic.qa. Um, okay, Rebecca, thank you so much again. We will see you next uh, Wednesday. You will we love your work. We we'll love yeah. your work. Thank and you. thank you thank you to all of our attendees thank you for your time uh, thank you for spending this um, time with us and uh, we hope to see you next week stay safe and well good night good night <laughs>